take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. The Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Good day, tokers and tokettes and non-toking lovers of liberty. It is Monday, November 23rd, 2015, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. It is so good to be home. I am back at Rolla J Studios in beautiful legal potland, Oregon, after 11 days on the road. My first trip ever to a foreign country. Yeah, believe it or not. I'm approaching 48 years old, and this was my first ever trip outside of the United States. I went to Jamaica, man, and had a good time covering the High Times Cannabis Cup down there in Jamaica, as well as getting a good chance to look around in the grill and in Montego Bay, meeting a lot of the locals, checking out some of the sites. Oh, it was just a beautiful time. Uh, I'll have some of that audio up on my SoundCloud page, plus photos available through all my Radical Russ social media outlets once I get done unpacking all this data. Also, I left from Jamaica to Washington, D.C. I was in uh, Arlington, Virginia, the Crystal Gateway, Crystal City area by the Pentagon for the International Drug Reform Conference 2015. They hold this every two years. Last uh, was 2013 in Los Angeles. Next will be 2017 in Atlanta, Georgia. And my goodness, folks, what an amazing four days we had. It was the largest ever gathering of drug law reformers on the planet. They had finally, by the, by the end tally, over 1,600 people that attended this conference over the four-day span. And coming from 71 different countries, representatives from almost every continent except uh, Antarctica, I believe. So it was an amazing, comprehensive conference, and we're going to bring you some of that audio today on the show. Coming up in the Radical Rant segment at the end of the show, we're going to play for you uh, one of the greatest public speakers I've ever heard, Deborah Peterson Small from Break the Chain. She's one of the co-founders of that organization, and she makes the case... Uh, for changing our punitive drug laws, ending prohibition. She questions some of the framing around our drug laws. Her little point about three strikes was the talk of the conference. But also, she made a call for drug war reparations. That's right, reparations. She said it. And we're going to talk about that today on the show. We're going to talk about that in our Behind the Headlines segment and just ask the question, how would that work? How could reparations from the drug war benefit the African-American community that's been so devastated by the disproportionate enforcement of the drug prohibitions? So we'll talk about that. Also in drug war data mining today, we're going to take a look at polling for marijuana legalization in North America, Canada, the United States, and now a new poll coming out of Mexico. Also on the show, it is Monday. That means we get our regular visit with Dr. Mitch Earlywine in our cannabis Q&A segment. We'll take your live calls at 971-533-7111. If you've got any questions for the doctor on cannabis science, culture, history, or health, get that number ready. It's 971-533-7111. But of course, we start everything off with the cannabis radio news. We've got headlines coming to you from Alaska, from Florida, from Pennsylvania, from New York City, and from a tribe in Wisconsin. Then stay tuned for Hour 2 Toker Talk Radio. We take more live calls, give you our 420 daily Toker tune, and we're going to talk about, talk about white privilege, cops stealing more than the robbers, and was Ohio's legalization vote stolen? You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. The son of a Polish immigrant who grew up in a Brooklyn tenement. He went to public schools, then college, where the work of his life began, fighting injustice and inequality, speaking truth to power. He moved to Vermont, won election and praise as one of America's best mayors. 
In Congress, he stood up for working families and for principle, opposing the Iraq War, supporting veterans. Now he's taking on Wall Street and a corrupt political system, funded by over a million contributions, tackling climate change to create clean energy jobs, fighting for living wages, equal pay, and tuition-free public colleges. People are sick and tired of establishment politics, and they want real change. Bernie Sanders, husband, father, grandfather, an honest leader, building a movement with you to give us a future to believe in. I'm Bernie Sanders, and I approve this message. Dr. Dabber, hurry! Its temperature is shooting past 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. It's burning up! I'm afraid for this little guy, it's just too late. What caused the problem? Only Dr. Dabber can maintain the perfect temperature for a smooth-tasting, slower burn. This standard vaporizer lost all of its health benefits, sending it up in smoke. So you're telling me that most vapor pens burn so hot they produce smoke, not vapor? Correct! Keep away from those standard vaporizer pens and turn to Dr. Dabber, doctor's order. Less heat, <laughs> more flavor. It's time for the Cannabis Radio News, covering the latest headlines in consumer cannabis, medical marijuana, and industrial hemp. Cannabis Radio News is available exclusively through CannabisRadio.com in partnership with the Associated Press. Now, your marijuana headlines in 4 minutes and 20 seconds in the Cannabis Radio News. This is your Cannabis Radio News for Monday, November 23, 2015. The board tasked with writing rules for Alaska's recreational marijuana industry voted Friday to allow for people to use pot at certain stores that will sell it, a first among the four states that have legalized cannabis. The three to two vote by the Marijuana Control Board also changed the definition of the term in public to allow for consumption at some pot shops, none of which are open yet. Colorado, Washington, and Oregon have legalized recreational marijuana but ban its public use, including in pot stores. Voters last November passed the state's initiative legalizing recreational pot use by those 21 and older. The initiative banned public consumption but didn't define public. The board amended the definition to allow for consumption in a designated area at certain licensed pot stores. It had previously said it lacked the legal authority to create a type of license permitting public use. State health officials announced Monday that five Florida nurseries have been chosen to cultivate and distribute the first legal marijuana in the state. Each of the five nurseries teamed with consultants, investors, and out-of-state pot growers to develop their application and were chosen from a pool of 28 applicants from around the state. The decision moves the state closer to implementing the 2014 law that allows for marijuana low in euphoria-inducing tetrahydrocannabinol, or THC, and high in cannabidiol, or CBD, to be grown in Florida to treat patients with intractable epilepsy and people with advanced cancer. Under the law, applicants must have been in business in Florida for at least 30 years and grown a minimum of 400,000 plants at the time they applied. Each of the growers now will have 10 business days to post a $5 million performance bond to show they are serious about obtaining that license. A Pennsylvania State House committee advanced a medical marijuana bill in a bipartisan vote last Wednesday, but passing it into law will still likely require changes. The vote was 25 to 8, with all Democrats voting in support of the bill and Republicans split. The bill passed the Senate in May, 40 to 7. The bill was scheduled for a full House vote today, but the vote has been pulled from the schedule. Sources told the local ABC affiliate that an amendment is expected to be introduced that would water down Senate Bill 3 by putting caps on THC and the number of cannabis plants. A rally was held in the Capitol Rotunda at noon today. A family who lost their child to Dravet syndrome, a severe seizure disorder, spoke, saying they believe their child would still be alive if medical cannabis was legal in Pennsylvania. Cops are following through on New York City Mayor de Blasio's pledge to stop locking people up for carrying small amounts of pot. Police cuffed 18,120 cannabis consumers through October 20th, a 40% plummet from the 29,906 pot busts in the same period last year, State Division of Criminal Justice records show. At the same time, tickets for pot violations have surged. Cops handed out 13,081 low-level pot summons through the end of September and are 
and are on pace for more than 16,000 tickets. The NYPD issued 13,378 pot tickets for all of last year and 13,316 tickets in 2013, records show. City Hall ordered cops last year to ticket suspects they caught with 25 grams or less of marijuana instead of arresting them after district attorneys and activists clamored for drug decriminalization. Still, arrests outnumber tickets citywide, and there appears to be wide variations in enforcement. Less than a month after its land was raided, the Menemeni tribe uh, has filed a lawsuit against the DEA and the Department of Justice. The Wisconsin tribe wants to clarify whether it's legal for it to grow industrial hemp on its reservation, which the tribe considers to be equal to a state. Quote, we still stand firm on that belief that, yes, we fit the guidelines, end quote, said Gary Basaw, the Menemeni Indian tribal chairman. The guidelines Basaw is talking about are those in the 2014 Farm Bill. Basaw says the bill allows his tribe to team with the College of Menemeni Nation to research and grow industrial hemp. The DEA has said the tribe wasn't growing industrial hemp. After the October raid, the DEA reported it confiscated 30,000 high-grade marijuana plants. The tribe hopes to have a decision by spring in hopes of possibly starting another hemp crop. This has been your Cannabis Radio News for Monday, November 23, 2015. I'm Russ Belville. The Russ Belville Show. Chat is for friends 18 and older. We expect our chat to be civil, mature, and free from excessive profanity. If you don't like these rules, there are approximately 6 billion other chat rooms with lower standards that you can visit. Imagine life without taxes. Let New Era Certified Public Accountants, NewEraCPAs.com, Handle your Cannabis 280E in tax strategy. Get your business prepared with New Era CPA's Cannabis Finance Boot Camp. NewEraCPAs.com, with years of experience in the industry, we are one of the nation's leading accounting firms for growers, dispensaries, and ancillary companies from Washington to California. NewEraCPAs.com. Gondrepreneur.com, your guide to the cannabis business world. Gondrepreneur.com is a comprehensive resource for cannabis professionals and entrepreneurs. Download the Gondrepreneur app on your smartphone or tablet to catch up on cannabis industry news, scroll through our daily job listings, and learn about successful cannabis companies, executives, and investors. Gondrepreneur.com, helping Gondrepreneurs grow. Welcome back, everybody. Time to go behind the headlines. And later today in the Radical Rant, you're going to hear a powerful speech uh, from Deborah Small from Break the Chains, where she calls for reparations in the drug war. And the idea being that the drug war has disproportionately impacted people of color. So as we legalize marijuana, there ought to be a way to see that a majority of that uh, benefit of that profit goes back to help those communities that were so damaged. And reparations are nothing new. This has been talked about ever since the end of slavery when uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman promised 40 acres and a mule to all the freed slaves, which would be a hell of a bargain compared to the actual amount that's been floated anywhere from 5.9 to 14.2 trillion dollars of reparations. But the whole idea of reparations has always been kind of uh complicated and controversial because who exactly gets paid and how much, right? Uh, Not all black people in America can trace their ancestry to a former African slave. And would it matter if that slave was kidnapped in the 19th century or all the way back to the 17th century? Would you pay more or less? Uh, Some black people have less black ancestry. Do they get a smaller cut? What about the children of freed blacks? What about new immigrants who don't have any Uh, uh, black uh, slave history, but are still treated differently because they're black. I mean, it's a very complicated subject, no doubt about it. But within the drug war, and specifically within marijuana legalization, we've got some pretty detailed records and data about exactly who was impacted. Maybe we could examine ways to repair the damage the drug war has wrought on African-American communities without wading into the thickets of who is more deserving of the reparations. First of all, as we legalize weed state by state, we can put an end to these prohibitions on licensing anybody who has a previous conviction for marijuana offenses. 
that has a racist impact. I mean, cops are more likely to bust black folks, so then those black folks are less likely to be able to get legal licenses in the new market. And besides, it doesn't make that whole, a whole lot of sense. Why would we want to prevent people with the most experience in marijuana from being the legal operators in that market? Isn't the idea of legalization to turn criminals into law-abiding citizens? Another thing we might consider is seeing that the distribution of the tax revenues from marijuana legalization get earmarked to specific programs to benefit people of color and their communities that have been devastated by the drug war. Educational benefits, perhaps. But those two suggestions still don't stop the Yale MBAs and the already well-capitalized white businessmen from coming in and reaping the lion's share of profit in the new green rush. So consider this. Why not create an affirmative action program for marijuana licensing that encourages the formerly illegal to join the legal marketplace? A scoring system, perhaps, that gives various points for previous possession, cultivation, or trafficking convictions, plus more points for every year of incarceration. Now, I can, I can imagine the criticism of this would be uh, you're rewarding criminal behavior, but I'd spin it as, no, we're giving recruiting bonuses to pull the best marijuana talent into the legal marketplace. And the nice thing about that, the point system, is it wouldn't necessarily be racially based because somebody like Jeff Mazansky, who ended up doing you know 22 years in prison, a white guy did 22 years in prison, would score high on those points too and be able to be you know ahead in the line for licensing. Another idea might be to distribute the licenses based on the disproportionate criminal enforcement of the former prohibition. Like, for example, if a county locked up 60% black people, 25% Latinos, and 15% whites for marijuana trafficking, then let's take its 10 potential dispensary licenses and give six of them to black people, three of them to Latinos, and one to a white guy. Same with cultivation licenses based on cultivation bust rates and give the bud tender and trimmer jobs based on possession bust rates. It would help to create a new marijuana industry that's dominated by people of color, but, and also help, you know, lift up their decimated communities, but would still give some preference to the white people who also have been victims of drug war incarceration as well. I mean, it's not a perfect solution. Don't get me wrong. I mean, why should the growers and dealers who managed to get caught get to cut in line in front of the people who didn't get caught? That's one problem I can think of. But come on, fellow white folks. We all felt a little less guilt when we gave the Native Americans most of the casino market. Why not turn over most of the marijuana market to the blacks and the Latinos who paid the price to keep all of us high all these years? It's something we ought to discuss, something to think about, and coming up in hour two, we'll take your live calls at 971-533-7111. That's just how white folks will do you. <laughs> well, President Obama, we're trying to find a new way. Let's find a way to help this fix the damage of the drug war. Stay tuned later for uh, Deborah Small's take on this. Uh, it's just amazing. It's going to open your mind to think about some of this stuff. Happy 420, folks, in the Mountain Time Zone. we got to take a break. We'll be right back after this. The Russ Belleville Show, where we don't change our position on decriminalization in an election year. The Russ Belleville Show is proudly sponsored by the Marijuana Business Association. The MJBA, called by NBC News the Cannabis Chamber of Commerce, is the fastest growing business association in the fastest growing industry in America. I've been working with the MJBA for years and I personally invite you to join the MJBA. MJBA also publishes the popular MJ Headline News on Facebook and the MJNewsNetwork.com and Marijuana Channel 1 on YouTube. Visit MJBA.net for more details. Your connection to quality cannabis insurance services is spelled K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R. -E -E That's Karcher Insurance. We have worked with ventures like cannabis for over 60 years. We're proud to represent over 50 companies with tailor-made cannabis plans for owners just like you to insure your product, your plants, and your pursuits. K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R -E -E spells out their full-service insurance services ranging from commercial 
commercial to bonds to personal from life to health and more. Contact the team at KarcherInsurance.com and let our experience work for you. That's K-A-E-R-C-H-E-R Insurance.com. Contact Karen and the team at Karcher Insurance at 1-844-421-3560. That's 844-421-3560. Arguing for the end of adult marijuana prohibition is easy because we have facts, science, reason, compassion, evidence, truth, and logic on our side. It is even easier when researchers catalog it all for us. Learn how to gather the facts on marijuana use, arrests, seizures, rehabs, drug tests, and more in this edition of Drug War Data Mining. Today in the Drug War Data Mines, we take a look at the national polls in North America as marijuana legalization becomes more and more popular. Of course, recently the Gallup poll came out once again here in the United States, showing that 58% of the people support the legalization of marijuana. In Canada, the polls are even greater at 59% in the most recent, I think it was a staff poll, 59% of the Canadian people are in support of marijuana legalization. And that's also uh, bolstered by the recent sweep of the liberals into power in Canada and their their, uh, prime minister, Justin Trudeau, who campaigned on the platform of legalizing marijuana, who's already got his justice ministers working on the plan to legalize nationwide in Canada. Of course, the United States has four states already with legal cannabis and another five that are on deck, at least five, that are on deck for legalized marijuana coming up in the next election. 23 states with some form of medical cannabis recognition And another couple of states probably on deck, Florida, maybe Missouri, uh, going for medical marijuana. And down south in Mexico, we've recently gotten the decision by the Mexican Supreme Court on the case of five petitioners who petitioned for the right to use cannabis and citing the Mexican Constitution's protections on the development of self and personality. The Supreme Court agreed, but it's not something that carries precedent for the whole nation. It only applies to those five petitioners. There are a few other cases coming, and according uh, to reports, if there's another uh, eight of those, that uh, it would take four more consecutive decisions of the same kind, or eight of the 11 permanent justices to agree for the Mexican Supreme Court's ruling to set an official precedent and force the government to review the law. This is according to Reuters news agency. So with Mexico poised to legalize marijuana, Canada poised to legalize marijuana, uh, and the United States legalizing it state by state, the most interesting piece of data that we get out of North American marijuana legalization polling comes today, as reported by Reuters, two-thirds of Mexicans are against decriminalizing marijuana. 66% of the people polled, and this was in a telephone survey by El Universal newspaper, opposed legalizing marijuana. Two out of three of the Mexican people. And it's a stunning result when you understand that over 100,000 people have died in drug-related violence in Mexico since 2007. And, of course, another tens of thousands of Mexicans who've been disappeared, who we don't know if they're dead, kidnapped, held captive or what. And for the Mexican people to not make the connection that the legalization of cannabis is what's going to reduce that drug-related violence is a real travesty. It's, It's just sad that they don't understand that. The cartels are in business because of the prohibition profits that allow them to continue their murderous rampage. You don't see Dos Equis and Corona shooting it out in the streets of Matamoros, right? It's just not happening. So this poll showing only 66% support or 66% uh, opposition to marijuana legalization is troublesome. However, there is a little silver lining. In that same poll, 63% said they backed a wide-ranging debate on marijuana legalization in Mexico. A wide-ranging debate. 
So it makes you wonder if when they talk about legalization in Mexico, whether the people are voting against a commercialization of marijuana in Mexico, and maybe they would be open to other options, decriminalization, uh, uh, community gardens, uh, limited legalization, like something uh, the Netherlands might have. But we'll keep our eyes on these polls and the efforts to try to get the Mexican people to understand that what's in everybody's best interest here is the end of this marijuana prohibition. Certainly some of this is attributable to Mexico being a very Catholic country, being very conservative in those issues, uh, considering drug use to be a moral failing. But it's important that we get much more education in Spanish to our friends south of the border to understand the need to end adult marijuana prohibition. I'm Radical Russ. We'll be right back with Dr. Mitch Earlywine from Burning Issues with your Cannabis Q&A live on CannabisRadio.com. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. Hey, everybody, it's Radical Russ here from 420 Radio, inviting you to be like me and get your ink done at Lucky Horseshoe Tattoo, Fort Worth's most female-friendly, clean, sterile, awesome tattoo shop. Thomas and his crew are true artists who can design you a custom piece or use a design you bring in. Lucky Horseshoe Tattoo also offers all styles of tattooing as well as piercings and all-around fun. In the DFW area, stop by Lucky Horseshoe Tattoo and tell them Radical Russ sent you. Trust me, it'll feel awesome. MJWellness.com, the largest medical marijuana community in the world. Connect with thousands of patients, doctors, industry leaders, and businesses through shared personal experiences along our worldwide network. Discover new therapies and benefits with content tailored to you. Come grow your network on MJWellness.com. You're not alone. Your wellness matters. Learn, live, and thrive. Check out MJWellness.com today. It's time for the Russ Belleville Show's Cannabis Q&A with Dr. Mitch Earlywine. Dr. Earlywine is a professor of psychology at the State University of New York at Albany and a leading author and researcher on cannabinoids and health who pins the Ask Dr. Mitch column for High Times Magazine. Get your questions ready in our live chat or call in to 971-533-7111 now. Welcome back, everybody. Time for our cannabis Q&A. And uh, I saw Dr. Mitch show up in our chat room, and I'm trying to reach him on Skype, but he's there's Dr. Mitch on Skype. How you doing, Dr. Mitch? Hello, Mitch. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we got you there. We got, I saw your, your Skype was offline. I was worried. Oh, okay. Glad to have you here. Dr. Mitch is the host of Burning Issues here on CannabisRadio.com, weekly podcast dedicated to enlightening people on the truth about cannabis. And uh, Dr. Mitch, what's coming up on your next show? Oh, it's curious. I had a really intriguing interview with uh, Libertarian uh, Executive Vice President of the Cato Institute, um, David Bowes, and he actually, you know, we had a good time. It was fun. All right. Check that out on CannabisRadio.com. You can get all the uh, Burning Issues uh, episodes available there for download on demand, and uh, we'll have more. We'll make more of those as we go. But Dr. Mitch joins us every Monday and has for years now to discuss our Cannabis Q&A. The phone lines are open. If you've got a question on cannabis science, culture, history, or health, the phone line is 971 971- 533-7111. But uh, as we wait for your calls, we've got a few other stories that we can talk about. And at the top of the list, Dr. Mitch, a very interesting study that was uh, shown up on Medical Daily that claims childhood sexual abuse is linked to marijuana use, but it really may all be in the genes. What can we glean from this study? So this is actually a, a neat crew out at Wash U have this uh, big data set of twins uh, down in Australia. And it looks like folks who run into trouble with cannabis, it's probably a, a heritable 
contributor as far as that is concerned, but there's usually you inherit some kind of propensity towards a reaction to the drug, and a stressor, a big stressor like uh, child abuse may be uh, what contributes to, you know, that, that leap from, you know, experimental use to troubled use. I, you know, didn't want to make too big a deal out of this just because it's a, a very complicated genetic analysis and this individual gene may not replicate, but we've seen heritability of cannabis dependence symptoms back when uh, that was the diagnosis. So it wouldn't stun me uh, that there's a, a heritable contributor. Okay, so so somebody who's comes from a family where they've got a difficulty with marijuana use, uh, that may be something that leads to their own difficulty with marijuana use, the heritability you're speaking of. Exactly, and it looks like actually not from these data, but from other data sets, what you inherit is often the response to cannabis itself. And so uh, that subset of folks may find it more pleasant or uh, uh, a good way of, of getting their minds off certain stressors. But it's the combination of that and uh, a stressor like childhood abuse that that seems to be uh, what what leads to the actual dependence symptoms. Does that mean that some of those people out there that say when they first smoke they don't get high, maybe that's genetic? Uh, there's certainly a heritability to that initial response, but that not getting high actually seems to be linked to an inability to know how to inhale. <laughs> so, uh, it's kind of an intriguing uh, first step. Well, I did not inhale. I did not like it, and I never tried it again. So, <laughs> Well done, sir. <laughs> Let's take a look at this other study, which uh, this one was interesting because uh, here in Oregon, we've recently gotten these new placards that have to be handed out whenever there's a cannabis purchase at our legal stores that talks about there may be damage to the fetus, there may be problems for pregnant women, maybe you shouldn't smoke pot, and there's always these studies saying this or that bad thing about moms who smoke pot, but this study says that prenatal exposure to marijuana can affect your kid's vision in a good way. Tell folks about this one. So I was pretty stunned by this, but uh, basically in this rather complicated um tracking uh visual tracking task the kids who were uh at age four and were the ones who uh had moms who had exposure to cannabis during pregnancy were actually doing better on this it's not a huge effect but it's definitely something um that you know was statistically significant i want to emphasize as i would if it had gone the other way that these weren't randomly assigned and i'm guessing that these were folks who you know, had mothers who may have been particularly good at comparable tasks. Uh, if they had done an adult test of something in the same domain, I would have found this a little more uh, easy to follow. But the other thing is, I, I'm just sort of spitballing here, but I'm wondering if it may have been something a little like that uh, cannabis protecting against alcohol-induced damages in the brain, that if these were parents who actually were pretty drug-involved, the ones who did alcohol and alcohol alone may have actually done more damage to their kids, while the ones who uh, had cannabis on top of the alcohol may have protected against. I'm still really down on drug use uh, during during pregnancy, and so I just wanted to emphasize that uh, this isn't this isn't exactly a prenatal vitamin. Yeah, and and there's there's so many different confounders when we try to. Uh get any information out of this sort of stuff because you can't you know just randomly assign half the pregnant women to smoke pot uh it's all self-selecting and such and who knows maybe maybe people that already have these enhanced visual skills are more likely to be people that want to smoke pot and then their kids inherit those visual skills is that kind of something you, you got happen? it exactly right man that that's that's it and i think there's uh some comparable animal work that really needs to be done where we could do random assignment and just checked, uh, I mean, obviously rats can't do this task, but they do do visual spatial tasks, and we could see if uh, that enhancement does replicate that way and have a stronger causality argument. All right. We have a headline coming out of Time magazine on time.com that says one in 10 people in the U.S. have abused drugs. And that's where we have to define what do we mean by abused and what do we mean by drugs? So what's crazy about this is this is one of the hugest face-to-face uh, -face interviews from a national survey back in 2012. And it's unfortunate because the diagnosis for uh, drug abuse is actually no longer around. The DSM-5 has a, an addiction syndrome. So I'm, I'm apprehensive about making too much of this. 
But the take home message is that about 10% of folks have had some kind of drug related problems actually is consistent with data we've had in the past. Um, but that includes cannabis, cocaine, hallucinogens, heroin, uh, the whole gamut. And I, I think um, the, the clincher is we want to you know, emphasize that, hey, this can happen to anyone despite the heritability and the uh, class differences and things like that we've mentioned, and that the opioid-related things are clearly up. So I could split hairs about the diagnosis of dependence, but just the fact that we've got literally more uh, painkiller abuse than we've ever had is something for everybody to keep in mind. By all means, uh, leave those things alone if you can. We're speaking with Dr. Mitch Earlywine, the host of Burning Issues on CannabisRadio.com. And if you got a call in question, the phone line is 971-533-7111. Or if you'd like to email your question in, you can send it to 420research at gmail.com, and we might tackle it in a future show. Uh, another study showing an alarming link between alcohol, drug use, and campus rape. This is, as a professor on a college campus, I'm sure this is a topic you deal with quite a bit. Well, actually, this is my friend Kate Carey, who used to be at Syracuse University, and she you know, did a really good job of getting some candid responses. But uh, in a large sample, over 400 uh, freshman women, suggested about 15% had experienced some kind of sexual assault while basically incapacitated by drugs or alcohol. And I feel like the, the only thing to say about this is, oh my God, this is horrible. And it's time to let uh, intervening be the social norm now. So if you see somebody passed out, get that person somewhere safe, regardless of race, creed, gender, sexual orientation or whatever. We don't want people to do that. And then let's definitely set the norm that this is completely uncool to, you know, even be trying to kiss somebody who isn't conscious. Like this is just so wrong in so many ways and just so hostile and reprehensible. And we've had data comparable to this literally for decades. And it says a lot about uh, make, making better decisions as far as alcohol is concerned. I really feel like when you look at the norms, most folks really do not drink very much at all. Uh, have maybe one or two drinks in an evening, and it's just a, a outlying crew that happen to drink four or more on any individual occasion, and that seems to be what's putting folks at risk for uh, these assaults. Yeah, and such a shame that so many colleges, uh, there's some sort of drug testing involved that kind of incentivizes the use of alcohol or these harder drugs rather than marijuana. Is there is there really much to people that are marijuana alone uh, consumers seeing this increased link with campus rape? We don't have those data in either direction, um, but in part, it's it's hard to get funding to look at that and that alone. And so I, I'm finding that a little bit suspicious. The other thing, I mean, I want to hammer home the disparate penalties. So if you're caught with an illicit drug of any kind on some campuses, you're expelled. And that's just not the same penalty for alcohol at all, even with underage drinking. So uh, what is potentially a safer uh, drug in this case for numerous reasons, including probably a, a decreased likelihood simply because uh, who smokes so much pot that they pass out? <laughs> yeah. Then then uh, here we were essentially, you know, setting things up so the contingencies are completely asked backwards. Yeah. All right. And uh, finally, we've got a story out of Tech Times that very interesting because we've talked about kids and ADHD and Adderall and so forth. And this study said that kids who take ADHD medications like Adderall are more likely to be bullied. And, and what's behind that? I'm afraid this is just a, a mask for actually kids with ADHD are more likely to be ah. bullied. And it's a very sad dynamic, and it, uh, it's funny because the qualitative work is actually what revealed it most. I thought, oh, these kids will be tough, and they'll be quick to anger and probably not be something somebody that a bully would want to target. But in fact, when you interview the bullies, what they say is they know the ADHD kid is in trouble a lot and that if they pick on them, uh, odds are high the teacher's not going to believe them. And that just breaks my heart. Mm. I was just like, oh, my God, what kind of bully basically goes after somebody with that rationale? But that seems to be part of the case. So I don't think this really has anything to do with the ADHD meds so much as this odd dance between the bullies and the bullied 
that uh, ADHD tends to put folks at risk for. Was it, wasn't there something in there about being bullied to sell or give away their meds, though? Oh, it's interesting because at the end of the article, she does say that at, at Valari. Um, yeah. Oh, what a bummer, man. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's just not only are you more likely to get in trouble, but hey, I want your drugs. Yeah. Just, it, it, it's, a new, it's the new twist on the old, hey, kid, give me your lunch money. Exactly. Oh, exactly. My gosh. Well, folks, check out Dr. Mitch on the Burning Issues podcast on CannabisRadio.com. You can also reach him by email at 420research at gmail.com. And uh, we'll speak to you next Monday. Thanks, Dr. Mitch. Okay, man. Talk to you soon. All right. When we come back, an amazing oratory from Deborah Peterson Small, co-founder of Break the Chains, on the need for drug war reparations and the insanity of baseball metaphors for criminal justice. You're listening to The Russ Belville Show on CannabisRadio.com. You're tuned into The Russ Belville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Warning. Hits taken on this show are larger than they appear. Do not try this at home. These people are professionals. Or at least they pay me to say that. You know Herb Thrasher from the Herb Thrasher Flower Hour. Now get ready for Herb Age Designs for the proud cannabis consumer. Herb Age Designs. Lifestyle gear for the 420 friendly. Herb Age Designs. We've got frisbee golf discs and durable hemp gear. Herb Age Designs. We've got shot glasses, drinking glasses, coffee mugs, and beer cozies. Check us out on Facebook and online at HerbAgeDesigns.com. And follow Herb Age and Herb Thrasher on Twitter. Great websites today need expert web design and development and need to be e-commerce ready and mobile friendly. But building a marketable and profitable website can be an uphill climb. Ready to make your new website or replace your existing website? Think Orange as the new way to get in the black. Orange Hill Development works with Fortune 500 companies and offer the same top quality development service at a fraction of what other providers charge. Brands like Absolute, Carlsberg, and Nestle trust Orange Hill Development. Find out why you should trust your website with Orange Hill. Contact Orange Hill for a consultation today at orangehilldevelopment.com. We must wage what I have called total war against public enemy number one. I support a change in law to end federal criminal penalties for possession of up to one ounce of marijuana. That marijuana, pot, grass, whatever you want to call it, is probably the most dangerous drug. Some think there won't be room for them in jail. We'll make them. I experimented with marijuana a time or two, and I didn't like it and didn't inhale. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. Entirely legitimate topic uh, for debate. Radical rant. And now Deborah Peterson Small from Break the Chains at the International Reform Conference. Um, our next speaker is someone I have an incredible honor to introduce. It's very humbling. She was my boss when I worked at the Drug Policy Alliance for the first time, and so I was able to sit at her feet for three years and be amazed by her daily, the way that I'm sure all of you who joined us at the Black Lives Matter town hall were last night with her brilliance. Ms. Deborah Peterson Small is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So Deborah Peterson Small is founder and executive director of Break the Chains, a public policy research and advocacy organization committed to addressing the disproportionate impact of punitive drug policies on poor communities of color. It was founded in the belief that community activism and advocacy is an essential component of progressive policy and works to engage families and community leaders in promoting alternatives to the failed war on drugs by adopting public health approaches to substance abuse and drug-related crime. Please join me in welcoming the amazing Deborah Peterson-Small. Good morning, everyone. Can't tell you how happy I am to be here. Um, I want to start actually by acknowledging the shoulders that I'm standing on, because we did start with the memoriam. And there were three people there 
who were really important to me being here today. The first one was Dr. Benny Prem. He was one of the first people that I met when I came into this community. And throughout the entire time of my relationship with him, he was more than just an advisor. He was like the father that I didn't have. I could always go to him and talk to him about anything. And I really think it's important for people to get to know who he was and what it was that he contributed, because so many of us are doing work that was based on the things that he started back in the 1960s. The second person is Eddie Ellis, who literally took me to prison. I would not be here doing this work if it was not for him. He identified very early on when I was working for the Civil Liberties Union and going up to Albany that all he needed to do was to bring me to the place where the horrors were happening and then allow the rest to take care of itself. And I love Eddie and I miss him so much. And then finally, someone who wasn't included in that because he died almost a decade ago, but Keith Kyler, one of the founders of Housing Works, was also really, really instrumental in my development as an advocate, as a policy person, and as a fighter. Because Keith lived his life fully as the person he wanted to be, a drug user. He never shied away from that. He never denied that. He never felt ashamed of that. And to me, it's really important if this movement is really a movement about elevating people who use drugs, that we have at the forefront people who actually use drugs and are not ashamed to say it. I want to um, pick up where Ethan left off yesterday in talking about the importance of knowing our history. Because for me, you know, I came to this movement because of my belief and commitment to social justice. And I feel like I'm always learning more and more and more about how all these things tie together. So I want you all to go with me on a little history journey. I'm going to go even further back than Damon went. I'm going to go back 400 years because I think it's important for us to recognize that the Western civilization, of which most of us are a part, was built and funded on the promotion of addiction for profit. I want to repeat that. The Western civilization that we are part of, the Anglo-American enterprise of which the US was the most successful process, project was built and financed by promoting addiction for profit to sugar, tobacco, alcohol. The slave trade was developed in order to support the promotion of addiction for profit. Racism was invented to justify the slave trade, which was developed to promote addiction for profit. And here we are, 400 years later, after having built an empire on the backs of people that we got addicted to things so we could make money from them, now we have a new system of punishing people for the addictions we developed so that we can profit from the punishment. So I want to assert that the greatest addictions that Americans have is not to drugs. Our three biggest addictions are to denial, to punishment, and to the American dream. I'm going to take a minute on that one, because we talked about that a little bit yesterday. And I just want people to think about this, because we don't actually have critical conversations about the words that we use and what they mean. What is it to be a country that defines itself in terms of a dream, which is by definition not real? Like, really, our whole identity is built up in pursuing something that actually doesn't exist. And if we were real about our history, we would acknowledge that that period of goldenness, wonderful America, only lasted for 30 years. 
30 years out of an almost 300 year period, but we've defined our whole identity inside of this 30 year period when everybody seemed to be doing good because the rest of the world was doing bad. That's not sustainable. So one of the messages I have for you all is like it's time for us to wake up and live in reality, not in the dream. And in the reality of our, of our system that we're in now, one of the biggest problems that we have is our addiction to consumerism and to believing that we are what we consume. You know, I say that by definition, Drug prohibition cannot exist compatible with human rights. It's not possible to have a system based on prohibition that's compatible with human rights. Because by practice, it's a policy that requires that you punish people who are involved with drugs. We say that it's a war on drugs, but it's not a war on drugs. It's a war on people. You can't war on the plants. They keep growing no matter what we do. So what really this is, is a war on people. And it's not a war on people who are doing things that we all agree are problematic. It's a war on people that we don't like, who are doing things that are only problematic because they're doing them. All right? I mean, one of the biggest frustrations that I continue to have as a drug policy reform advocate is the willingness of so many people to feel it's OK to punish those other people for things that they're doing. And that, you know, reform is punishment light. But we never get to the point of, like, actually not talking about punishment. I say that as a society and culture, our relationship with drugs is rooted in hypocrisy, greed, human exploitation. We care more about our ability to be able to punish people than we care about actually preserving their health, than we do about protecting them. So I want to just go over just a few examples of real examples of the ways in which drug policies operate in ways that are dehumanizing. The first one I want to speak to, because I'm a female, is the way in which our policies are directed against women. One of the justifications for adopting these treaties in the first place was that they were going to protect women and children. And yet, what we have seen now in the US and in other countries is the stigmatization of women, and particularly of pregnant and parenting women, and the criminalization of their outcomes based on whether or not they use drugs. So in the 80s, it was crack babies. In the 2000s, it's oxytots. We never talk about poverty as a problem for people's birth outcomes. We never talk about all the legal drugs that people get to use, but we're more than willing to lock up women for that. Second, dehumanizing drug conspiracy laws, guilt by association. That's why Kemba got sentenced to all that time. They acknowledged that she didn't use drugs. They acknowledged that she didn't sell drugs, but she was guilty because of her association. What kind of dehumanization is that? And one of the consequences of that is that we use those conspiracy laws to force people to tell lies on each other in order to avoid having the majority of their life be spent behind bars. That is dehumanizing. Don't clap, because I only got three minutes. Last two points, three strikes laws. For me, this is something I really want us to think about, because we not only apply that in sentencing, we apply that in treatment, we apply that in schools, and we never ask ourselves, where the hell did street strikes come from? It's a baseball metaphor. Why do you have strikes in baseball? Because there is no clock. I'm serious, don't laugh. There's no clock in baseball. So the purpose of balls and strikes is to add some level of boundary and finality to an otherwise untimed game. But people are not like baseball. We're more like football and basketball, because our clock starts running from the moment that we're born. We are finite people. So we need to think about what it means to apply a sports metaphor that's designed in that context to people to people's lives, to say three strikes, you're out. What the hell does that mean? And we actually don't even critically examine how, that, how we came up with that 
how we're applying it, and what it actually means. Now, I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go to my last two points real quick, which is what is drug policy reform? This is, again, a point where history has to teach us something. In the same way that ending legal slavery did not equate with black freedom, ending mass incarceration is not the same as actually removing all the shackles, et cetera, that drug policies have placed on people of color. Okay, we need to actually think about what is the role that the drug war has played. It has been the space to continue to allow the economic, political, and social oppression and exploitation of people in general, but black and brown people in particular. So if our reform is not changing that power relationship, if all we're doing is taking off people's physical chains and putting them in the economic chains of having to pay for the privilege of not going to prison so that somebody else gets to profit, that's not real reform. And for all of you pot, pot entrepreneurs out there, my question to you is, are you going to be a parasite or a social engineer? Are you going to use your money to keep sucking the blood out of our community, or are you actually going to be part of the solution of applying reparations? And yes, I said that word, because God damn it, I am done with the idea of people having policies that screw over people for decades, and then one day they say, oh wow, we've come enlightened, my bad, and all of a sudden it's all good. And we're still left with the scars. We're still left with the hurt. We're still left with all of the damage that has been done. You guys owe us and I'm here to collect. See you. That's Deborah Peterson Small, co founder of Break the Chains, with an electric oratory that only needed a mic drop at the end of it to have been any more powerful. It's definitely something we need to consider. How do we repair the damage the drug war has wrought on the communities of color in this country? We'll talk about that coming up here in Hour 2, Toker Talk Radio. We'll take your calls at 971-533-7111. What kind of reparations are possible? What should there be reparations whatsoever? We'll talk about it and more coming up in the next hour. Also coming up, Bacon Dan will be calling in with our Roots Monday Daily Toker Tunes. We'll take a look at asset forfeiture in this country and learn that the cops are stealing more than the robbers. And we'll uh, finish things up with our tinfoil hat. Was Ohio's legalization vote stolen? We take a deeper look in hour two. That's all the time we got for today. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth.